Hello and welcome to episode three of Penny Dreadfuls, the most important conversation since 2016 years ago when God said, Jesus Christ, I'm bored. I'm Alex Ballinger. <laughs> and uh, I'm Amita Joshi. Um, and we've got a different feature this time. Um, just to let you know what's happening at the end of the show, Alex will be apparently quizzing me uh, and vice versa on our, what is it, knowledge of literature? Is that what you've collected? Yeah, I'm just taking this as an opportunity to kind of highlight your ignorance in certain areas where there right. should be none. Alex is going to try and make me look stupid and fail miserably, so uh, <laughs> do listen out for that. Um, a few other things. We'll also be discussing literature festivals um, as the rounds begin again this year. Um, are there too many celebrities? Um, do enough people even go to the festivals? Are they gaining traction for the right reasons? Um, we're also going to be looking at comic books, which Alex is thrilled I'm about. so excited about that. I don't know very much about, so it'll be a one-man show. Lucky listeners. <laughs> um, whether they are legitimate reading, is it a teenage niche, which is what I used to think. Um, maybe not by the end of the show. And also awards, so Nobel Prize winners, uh, the Man Booker Prize, the Costa Awards. Do we actually care about the winners of these books? Of course we do, but do we read those books? No, um, don't because care. I haven't read quite a lot of those, so we'll be discussing that as well. We'll start um, with a couple of bits of news, though, from the last week in books. Uh, first things first, bad news for any Game of Thrones fans or fans of the book, should I say, rather than Game of Thrones fans, because they are different. Um, George R. R. Martin's next book, uh, Winter Winds, will not be out this year, as was initially planned. Uh, it's looking like it's going to be a 2016 release date. I'm sure the internet has gone mental, and there are some very colourful turn of phrases being thrown around. Uh, I feel a little bit bad for him, because I'm sure it's not easy to write those books, because they are very big. Um, there was a lot of speculation over Christmas. It was believed that... I'm not sure how this came about. I'm sure it was just sort of rumours floating around on the internet which led to people believing these things but there was an expectation that either the book was going to be finished at Christmas or the publication date was going to be released at Christmas or the book itself was going to be released at Christmas none of those came about George R. R. Martin had to go on his blog and say you're being idiots stop looking at message boards and basically yeah that's not happening his uh, his his publishers uh, Harper Collins are sounding a little bit on the defensive actually saying um the, these books are really complex and they're quite difficult to write and that sort of thing and um spokesman said fans really ought to appreciate that the length of these monsters is equivalent to two or three novels by other writers so it really sounds like they're trying to defend um it does his it... yeah but i suppose backlog sort of thing of yeah writing. they must have a really strange relationship because everybody knows your publisher um and your boss is the person who is pushing you every day to make sure that you finish said chapter mm. but when you're writing a book like that and it is a creative process how on earth can you be timed the way they are and it's maybe craziness maybe george rr R. martin is a big enough superstar now that he can just say it's not happening yet you know if you were yeah. say this was your first no, novel the second novel or if your your writing wasn't a big deal yet but if you're george rr R. martin he's the closest thing to a literary superstar around at the moment really i would say other than sort of jk rowling and that sort of you know yeah, she's in a league of her own no yeah yeah, yeah, she should stay that way. Um, any other news? Yes, one more, one more. The Costa Book Awards uh, have announced that H is for Hawk by Helen MacDonald is the book of last year, 2014. I don't care. No, I, I can't really, even respond to that. No, I have <laughs> nothing else to say. Uh, it's a book about birds. Is it literally... I mean, I haven't even looked into this enough to know. Is it literally about I did a, I did a little bit of research on this it's a it's a non-fiction it's actually kind of uh, autobiographical it's about uh, her father dying apparently one day he was just like shopping on a high street and just dropped dead uh, and she was completely distraught by it and she always had a love of birds and ornithology and then she decided to turn uh, to yeah. she had a love of falconry and she, she didn't want to, to train um, a really vicious that's one. it it was the most yeah. apparently the most the biggest and the most vicious See, I'm bored just even giving the blurb. <laughs> I'm I'm really sorry, Helen, because I know this is probably know. quite a big deal for you. And, and, you know, she sounds like a true author. You know, she was talking about the process of writing that book and she said, I did it just like J.K. Rowling, um, which I spluttered 
my coffee out at. And she said, oh, but but I did. I wrote it in a cafe and it was uh, really oh, that's even Oh, that's even worse. It is not worse. I bet she did it in a Costa sponsorship deal, wasn't it? No, it was not in a Costa. How did she win the award then if it wasn't a Costa? It might have been a Costa. It, sh- it must um, have been. I hope it wasn't a Starbucks because they'll be taking the award away from yeah. her if they find that out. She's going to be in trouble. Um, I have no... I feel bad. I didn't take much notice about even when they narrowed it down and released a shortlist of books. I couldn't tell you who was in the shortlist. I didn't even see any of it. Yeah. All I saw was that, I think it was Guardian Books posted saying H is for Hawkers 1. I think it's a terrible name as well. I hate the name. <laughs> but I hate I hate birds generally. Um, I don't care about awards either. This actually works as quite a nice little segue into our first segment. But how do you feel about the award kind of system in books? Um... I just, it's awful, but I just, uh, considering it's a literary debate, there's lots of um, controversies around them, and they are about books, I just cannot feel involved in any of it. I just really don't. I don't know whether that's because me personally, uh, we've only just got out of uni, um, so we're doing an undergrad, so I'm still going through the backlog of books that I didn't read that I felt I should have on my course. Yeah. So... We never did any Dickens, so, you know, you go through that. We never did any Oscar Wilde, so I'm going through that. And so I just lose touch with what's what's in at the moment, um, which is pretty awful. I don't really. trust... I don't really trust them. I don't, I don't feel like it adds anything to it. I think if... if you know, they always... They re, they'll reprint a book when it wins an award or in yeah. in the yeah, case of some of the cheaper publishers they'll put a sticker on the front of it saying <laughs> recently won new cover. such and such an award yeah. and i just think i don't think that that means that's a good thing i don't think that that means that's a good book usually because i'm really into sort of my cult stuff and the classics and that sort of thing as soon as i see a little sticker or a little sign that says winner of such and such an award it instantly says to me that that's boring it's completely status <laughs> quo it's completely <laughs> it doesn't do anything to push the boundaries of books in any way it just completely conforms to what is a good story and what are good characters and it's just i see it as a standard of mediocrity when you win an award yeah it's it is tough i just i'm not sure who does i mean engage with it other than i'd be interested to know other than the media itself the literary editors but then Having said that, when a book does get announced, it, it, the sales do increase. Um, it's, I think like, it was bring up the, the bodies. I think it was the man booker, yeah. I was just about to say that it's considered as you will have international financial success, critical acclaim, if you win one of those awards, which is true, I guess. They do do really well for themselves. Hilary Mantel has won it twice now, I think, and she, which is a really um, big deal, apparently. I don't know anything about the awards, so that doesn't mean anything to me. No, I do no, I don't either. Apart from I know that it would be nice to win one, uh, despite I... <laughs> all my criticism of it. <laughs> be like, take you it would, with both hands. You would like Costa Coffee to um, reward your creative yeah. genius. I don't understand why Boston Tea Party yeah. Coffee Shop are not doing or awards. Hall. Yeah. Why has it got to be Costa? Um, Do you think it comes with a lifetime supply? Because that would be far more motivation than anything else for me. I See, I'd be worried if it did, because I would have cake every day. <laughs> You'd have so, cake, would you? Yeah. I would cappuccino myself to death, I think. Yeah. I would not live very long with a lifetime supply. I find it funny that it was Costa as well. I feel like it's really insincere. Just, it seems like it's a market employ to make people think that Costa is more cultured. You know, this whole kind of cafe culture of people sitting yeah, and sitting it, it in the coffee shop and writing. Because, I mean, a lot, there's a lot of um, community cafes now opening in London where... They are much smaller. They're run in, I don't know, someone's basement, but the coffee is like 50p and they'll refill it for you. And it's filled with books. Um, so there's quite a few in East London at the moment. Um, and I suggest people check them out. But Costa, I don't really associate as a place that has books lying around or even has a bookshelf. I'm not even sure if I've seen one. No, they don't. I would, um, I've would. i never seen one with one. And then I think that's the thing is that their coffee shops are kind of renowned. They're kind of linked with books in quite a big way historically and I think that Costa have tried to play on that without having any actual history of books or anything yeah, like that I, it's strange it was own. it's um Costa's owned by Whitbread is that's the company and they're like hotels restaurants that sort of thing and the Costa award was called the Whitbread Literary Awards uh initially it's been going for a long time but uh it was given to Costa in 2006 and I just can't yeah I can't feel like it's anything more than just Costa trying to bringing the book audience by putting their name on something. Yeah, it's very cheeky, isn't it? 
Um, incidentally, I read quite a few books by who were wit breadwinners, and I wonder whether that's just because they're older now, so they've become part of a, I don't know, a uni syllabus. Like I know, um, Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie one, and we had to read that for a for a, a module. So maybe I don't care about the awards right now, but mm. I will in fifteen years' time when See, that's they're one of the, like considered older. That's one of the criticisms that I have, especially of the Nobel Prize for Lit, is that they have a tendency to miss all of the really great people. I think that it's very rare that you get someone that wins a Costa Award or a Nobel Prize that is really remembered throughout the years. Hemingway won one. I'll give him that. They give, and he's obviously remembered. But I mean, they they skipped over Mark Twain. I know you don't like Mark Twain. Obviously, they're going to skip <laughs> over Mark Twain. <laughs> they skipped Mark Twain uh, because I don't actually know why they did, but that... I've got a few reasons if people want you to speak cannot, to me after the show. You I've got about three hours worth of reasons. You cannot so. deny that he's a very memorable name. Even the fact that you hate him shows that he's a very well-known name. But they also skipped over the Russians as well, and everybody loves the Russians. Tolstoy and Chekhov <laughs> got completely skipped over. And you can't not love the Russians. They're... Oh. Great writers. Tell that to yeah. Ukrainians. Oh, shots um, fired. Shots fired. Yeah. Literally. Anyway. <laughs> um, no, it's true. There is there is various issues with them. You know, the whole thing about now, it's all about historical novels. I know uh, we talked about this last yeah. time. But we did, I think you and I both did this separately, but we looked up how many are historical novels that have won over the last few years. And it was a good... The Man Booker is... 70%, I think. Yeah, the, the Man Booker know, the, is a majority historical novels that have won Hilary Mantel being a prime example of that and, and there are a few other ones like there was one Magic Realism which is obviously the one that I just said and Stream of Consciousness one which is quite cool but I can't there's only one it. comic one on the Man Booker which I think is a shame because I think comic books really are something that it is really a strong artistic form to be funny in book is really really difficult I would say yeah I'd agree I rarely Actually, yeah, it it is difficult. I was just thinking the last time I laughed when I read a book, and I have, but I don't know whether that's even supposed to be intentionally funny. It doesn't necessarily just... <laughs> always translate as humour either. Sometimes when someone says something because you haven't got that kind of emphasis on the way they said it, sometimes you take something as serious when actually it was completely intended to be a joke, and if it was said in a different circumstance, it would be hilarious. I laughed at my current book, actually, um, Philip Roth, uh, Portnoy's Complaint is a book about youth and sex and there's a good probably five, ten page segment about masturbation and I laughed. I I, I, I laughed. It was it I is see hilarious. It's something that you would laugh at. Actually, actually I'd probably laugh at it's, too. It's a true it's horribly honest. It actually hurts me how <laughs> honest it is. And I was sat I was sat on the tube That's just amazing. smiling to myself the whole time. It was actually brilliant. I d I don't trust the judging system either. Uh, there's something about you mm-hmm. having three people choosing out of all these books. And uh, one of the judges for Costa this year was this is his job title is head of buying which is a it's terrible just, he's the head of buying just, at foils that's the worst name and I think what what does that mean is head of buying what books so I guess he buys books to get in for foils to sell which, which is a he's a businessman he's not a literary critic or anything like that he's a businessman he'll buy what sells why is he a judge at a Costa competition also people who are buyers in in the in any industries if you're a buyer and you're in fashion you tend to know what the audience want rather than Um, what is actually so how much does that actually influence you in terms of okay this book should win because you know I guess Costa Costa book awards especially are popular books they do they don't do anything to sort of kind of underground or not quite as mainstream they're always popular books that they tend to they tend yeah. to win so that maybe that's a big part of it as well and also one of the other judges was um a producer from radio 2's book club and i don't trust anyone that works in radio i think they're all sketchy anyone that appears on the radio <laughs> is a t- especially especially <laughs> producers and especially producers of book shows i would go nowhere near them they have absolutely no idea what they're they talking are about. writing this down as you speak <laughs> alex <laughs> They have no idea what they're talking about. Everyone on radio, don't listen to them. Tune out of the show now because we don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, just tune into my Twitter instead. It's much more interesting. <laughs> it's much quicker as well. Um, no, I don't. I don't know what I think of them. I just, I just know that I don't. I don't read the books that they tell me to read. Maybe because I've had that all my life, where I've had 
school telling me what books to read or uni telling me, which has always been great. But now it's the freedom. I only listen to two people about what to read. Who are the two? Richard and Judy. The Richard and Judy Book Club is the only literary award that I take seriously. Sponsored by... Just take off your headphones. Sponsored by Galaxy. It is... The, they are the only people in the literary world that understand what is going on. <laughs> that was that was. I even I felt a little bit sick saying that. That is yeah, a complete sure joke. You did. I don't think um, I've ever read any. Haven't you got their poster on your wall? I do love Richard yeah, and Judy. Sure. <laughs> right next to Taylor Swift and Harry Styles. I know Taylor Swift has to be there. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's my thoughts on the awards. Um, not all that interesting. Maybe I will keep tabs on it now because we have such a, you know a well listened to show that I need to know these things so <laughs> I'll, I'll keep an eye on it Man Booker has been uh, criticised quite widely as well they all have to be fair actually but um, one of the judges I don't know if uh, A.L. Kennedy do you know him? no no I don't know him but um, he was a judge in 96 uh, for Man Booker and uh, what he said was quite spectacular actually he said this in 2001 um, and he said that it is a pile of crooked nonsense and he said that the winner is determined by who knows who, who's sleeping with who, who's selling <laughs> drugs to who, who married who, and whose turn it is. So that is oh, from a judge fantastic. that is quite. I really um, like the attack. whose turn it is, as if to say, I've written seven books and you haven't let me win. Yeah, come on. So you if I write an eighth, it's definitely my go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, but man, but and I, I slept believe. with him, so you know, I, I get, it. And I sold him a bag of weed once yeah. as well. So. <laughs> I love that. That sounds absolutely brilliant. In terms, in, that makes it sound like anyone can do this. This isn't every man's. Because <laughs> anyone can either sleep with someone or sell drugs to someone or marry someone. So we're all in with the chat. I haven't even written a book, but I might go and sell yeah. some coke to someone. You could and, make a start on the, those three first. And yeah, then yeah, write do that a book first. About your and then experience. Just do, then... do a Joseph Conrad, write a 96 page book. Exactly. That would take me about 15 minutes, I think. But that's been going since 1969, the man booker. So you would think that that would have some credibility to it. But uh, A.L. Kennedy does not agree in the slightest with that. He's not a fan, apparently. <laughs> but then uh, Nobel's been um, criticised as well for focus on focusing too heavily on Europeans, and particularly Swedish, because obviously it's the Swedish Academy that vote. Mm, there's um, always going to I think, be that tension there. I think there was the, f- the statistic that there have been more Swedish winners over the years than there have been from the entire of South America as, as an area, which is quite... a when you put it like that, I mean, you think they would vote for the for the kind of national heroes more than international, yeah. but then that is more than a coincidence by the sounds of it. I mean, there is the other debate as well that some countries just are richer in literature. So, you know, they, I went to a talk not that long ago, um, and it was held at Oxford University, and it was two scholars from India who were saying that the literary scene is you know, flourishing in India now, but it wasn't something that was always there, which is just a really strange idea to think that it wasn't always there because we've been brought up with it here. But actually, they've always had history and they've always had writers and they've always had all of that, but that prestige of, you know, literary festivals which have just started there and having awards and things, that is that is now. So then maybe they... You know, how how can they win at a time where they don't have as many? Yeah, well, then there isn't a representation sort of thing. But then there has to be a kind of proportional representation, don't you think? Yeah, there has no, to be... exactly. There should have probably have been somewhere along the line. I think it's in this country especially, I mean, it, maybe it's improving, but it does always seem to me that it's a very, I mean, kind of critically acclaimed, acclaimed writer. It's a very white thing. I think that a lot of award winners and things like that in this mm. country, there isn't proportional representation for the people writing books in this country for the population uh, yeah if you see definitely what I mean. and i always feel concerned that when they do let somebody win who isn't it's almost as if to say look we're not like that yeah uh, and to prove it to you we've got this poet Tokenism, who is from sort of nigeria thing, yeah. and you just think oh, great um although incidentally they are very good at writing um what topic yeah. do you want to go on to next do you want to move on let's let's have your bit um so that you can get it out of your system um do you want to do, I, you want to do comics yeah, I do want to do comics because I have got mixed feelings on comic books. Okay, let me start with a joke. we're not talking about comic books, ha ha, but... Let's start, let me start with a joke because we need to ease into this one with levity. I, I absolutely adore this joke. It came up on the internet the other day and I've been laughing at it since. Uh, what is the 
What is uh, Jay Gatsby's favorite superhero? Who? Green Lantern. <laughs> okay, what is his least favorite superhero? Who? Deadpool. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> what a great joke. <laughs> that yeah. is a great joke. But oh, yeah, so comics great. are. I was kind of, when I, as I was thinking about this earlier, I was writing some stuff down, and I was thinking it kind of is my forte because I really enjoy comics, but then I don't enjoy comics in the way that maybe it would be right to talk about them in a literary sense. Because whenever people talk about comics, first thing that comes to pretty much everyone's mind, I'm assuming, is going to be Batman, Spider-Man, DC Comics, Marvel Comics, that sort yeah, of thing. definitely. But increasingly now, graphic novels especially are becoming a real serious literary format. And they're doing some really interesting things because I absolutely love the six-year-old side of comic books. I don't read comic books as in the weekly serialised versions. I like I read yeah. graphic novels, which are generally collections of yeah. those comics into okay. one because I need the, incl- the kind of inclusive story. I need it all to be in one place rather than reading a segment a of a story and, and then, then wait in two weeks. Yeah. And then, yeah, I find that really frustrating. So I wait until it's released as a How graphic novel. How do you novel. watch TV series? Do you not? I or no, do you I don't. Them, so you watch them all in one go. I don't really like TV series. To be no, perfectly I mean, honest, I need films. Similar. Yeah. I because I I managed to watch you Game just of Thrones. Need closure, don't you? You need closure just in an episode. <laughs> you do because I watched the uh, Game of Thrones. I quite enjoyed that actually, but that took a little while. But Breaking Bad, I gave up on. I found Breaking Bad tedious. I found it so boring. It's the waiting. Yeah, and who can commit fifteen hours just to see if you like a show? That is absolutely ridiculous. When a film is two hours and you can yeah. like it and dislike it and you haven't wasted that much time. It's like we were saying about a book. It's such a huge commitment that you have to be absolutely hooked on it straight away yeah. to be able to spend that much time so enjoying it. So I'm really bad with TV series. So I don't read the comics as they're released. I always buy the graphic novels. But I like I like DC, DC comics and I like Marvel comics. I like the superhero stuff because I really like the way the universes unravel, how in-depth they are and... The fact that anything can happen. I really enjoy that, that there is literally anything in existence. I mean, how different is it from... Obviously, the visual element is incredibly important. If not, you know, that that is what it ma- what makes a comic book um, or part of. But then, I mean, because I have this experience where I've tried to read them. My brother collects comic books. So, um, you know, I've read a few. And some of the main ones I've read... Um, Uh, and been like okay this is quite good but then I can't retain that level of interest as in I start just looking at the pictures and I start I don't know what I'm doing and looking at how short the females clothing items are and then before you know it um, and before you know it I've not actually taken in any of the actual story um so do you is it like a different mind frame when you pick up a graphic novel and think yes I want to sit I would say yeah I would say that I would read them in two completely different circumstances so I can have I'll never have two books on the go at the same time I can't do that so I won't be reading sort of half of one book I'll read a couple of pages put it down read half of another book yeah see I do that you see I can't do that that kind of messes with my head I've got to finish the book that I'm reading but comic books that isn't the case I can read a comic book and have a novel on the go at the same time because I read them in different ways but the thing I love about comic books is I get this kind of excitement from when I was like six years old that's probably the biggest factor is that I loved so Spider-Man loved I loved Spider-Man yeah. when I was a little kid so I can read this stuff now and I really like the characters I find the story so exciting and involving because you never know which direction it's going to go and especially the Marvel comics are really existential there's a lot of kind of religious connotations and scientific connotations and kind of this whole universe that goes so far because there's kind of multiverse things and I could go on about this forever but I I read it with a real serious excitement that is just basically me being a little kid again. That's so, it's so nice to. I think anything that is associated with people's childhood, you do Instantly just. Instantly love you it. just like. Harry Potter well, is a perfect assuming example. Assuming most people have had a nice childhood, you do like it a lot. Um, exactly, like you said about Harry Potter. Harry Potter is a perfect you know, example. I still want to go to the studios and I haven't done that yet, but I'm waiting to March because they're opening a new section in it. Um, and God. why do you know you're My 24. Instagram needs to stop showing me pictures of people going to Harry Potter Studios. No, no one cares. I don't, everyone's cares. seen the bus, all right? No one cares. No, I can't wait. It's going to be great. It's going to be terrible. Um, because it reminds you of your childhood. Um, yeah. So you just, it's that something about childhood means escapism. You can just. I totally didn't see, see Harry Potter again. I didn't see the, the films uh, until I was quite a bit older. I must have been 
probably sort of 14, maybe. So I was beyond it being linked with my childhood. But everyone else that I know that really enjoys Harry Potter, and they do, they really love it. They read the books when they were really young, watched the films when they first came out, and I think uh, I must have been 11, and you would have been about 23. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so it kind of never was equated with my childhood. What, actually? I was lucky. Uh, Harry Potter was released in a way so that every age that I was, Harry was the same age. Yeah, that is quite a nice... Yeah. So it, I just had this such a neat synchronisation and for a neat freak like me, I mean, that was amazing that was as well. See, Lord um, of the Rings was for me. That was... Because came, they came out about the same time, I two, think. Was it two... Th- I was 11 about uh, the, when they both came the out. The films. Yeah, the films of Lord of the Rings came out. So that was kind of... The way that I went with it was that oh, I went yeah, to see. I much prefer the films. I went to see Rings. Lord of the Rings with my dad when they first came out, while everyone so else I... was going to see Harry Potter, and we weren't interested in that. Me and my dad, so we didn't. Oh, so I did both. Uh, so yeah, we didn't do Harry Potter. I so. dragged my dad to Harry Potter, like a midnight viewing. Oh man! A midnight Poor viewing, um, in another city because my town didn't have it at midnight, um, and he was then like, right, and I'm taking you to see Lord of the Rings. And I remember when it finished, and I didn't know very much about the book at the time, and I just thought, what a rubbish book. You don't know much about the book now. Yeah, that's a lie. <laughs> we'll uh, I just remember later. being like, why Why would they... Which stupid writer would end it with, and we're going to start on this quest, and then it's over. Uh, and then someone had to tap me on my shoulder and tell me that it's actually three books, and I had yeah, to walk uh, out very kindly. Yeah, I bet you were very disappointed. I think I went to see the midnight viewing of uh, Avengers Assemble, actually. And that was when I was 19, I think, so I can't really, can't really judge yeah. about the excitement on that. Yeah. But um, back to the actual topic, it was taking a nice little detour there. But um, com- uh, graphic novels especially are becoming, far, are becoming a more serious art form, I think. I mean, maybe there's going to be kind of pretentious people that think a book should be a book and that graphic novels are for kids, but they're taking on some really serious subjects. I don't know if you've ever heard of Persepolis. No. This one Obviously was this not. was what I I've never read the comic, but I've seen the film. I had to do this for A level film studies. It's about a young woman growing up in Iran and she's quite a dissident. She listens to a lot of heavy metal and things like that and it kind of doesn't agree with her because she lives in this it was about the time that uh, religious rule came into Iran. My history is terrible so I wouldn't be able to tell okay. you when that was. But then she because of fear for her her parents sent her away to paris so she went out and lived became an anarchist started listening to really heavy metal and going to gigs and got involved with boys all of the things that you can't do in iran and then she went back to iran and her father was a bit of a political activist sort of thing and it's a really interesting story it's a true story and it's absolutely brilliant and she initially released it as a graphic novel and i think the reason that she did that was because in iran everything is so heavily censored that you wouldn't be able to get away with doing that as a film or maybe as a book because it would be considered too serious. So if you do it as a graphic novel, I think it kind of took away that serious element Mm. to it and people thought, well, it's just a comic book, it's just for kids. But it it dealt with all the serious issues and then it was made into a film, which she wrote again, uh, and that was an animation. So it did the same thing. It came across with exactly the same art style, told the same story. It was absolutely brilliant. And that shows how you can, using graphic novel, you can get really serious with it. You can bring serious mm. stuff in. I mean, this is the thing. It has, particularly for somebody like me, who uh, obviously I'm not naive to what, what they are. I know they tackle um, more serious issues. And obviously there's so many different um, sub-genres within it. Um, and obviously all the different countries who, who create them as well. But they've always just been associated with children. So you always think, uh, it's just like a teenage niche that people like. Yeah, um, not even necessarily teenage. I think even younger than that. It's yeah, kind of you, exactly. Because I think initially, the first point that you get really excited about comic books is when you're a really, really little young. kid, really yeah. little kid. And then it kind of sticks with you. Because I think if you were to start reading comic books at sort of 18, you'd think this is just for kids. So like you said, it yeah. has to have that. You have to yeah, equate actually, it with your that's true. It has to be younger. My brother used to um, collect all the Beano little comic books and he was like five yeah see i never enjoyed so, that those beano things and that sort of thing but then i've always most of my love for superhero um stuff comes actually from there was a spider-man cartoon on fox kids i know which one you're talking i about. absolutely <laughs> adore it i, <laughs> I will, used to watch that. i've watched uh the whole series again about two years ago and i absolutely 
love it. I thought it was brilliant. And that's the reason why I like superhero stuff now. And it probably explains for a lot of my sarcasm because it's quite a bad influence yeah. on some kids. But it is it is more serious than people think. I mean, even when they were, you know, coming ahead, there was a point in the seventies where you had all of the Marvel comics getting really, really popular. Uh, but at the same time, there was a another group of people who thought, oh, that's too mainstream, as you have with everything, and then were creating the really non-mainstream comic books and graphic novels, which is kind of, yeah, it just shows it's just a lot more complex than people think. Yeah, um, and if you think about it in terms of art, it is really, it combines so many different art forms in such an interesting way, because, I mean, it... it kind of invokes the novel in the sense of you've got the story and there's usually a narrator sort of kind of some on on omnipotent narrator that you have and then you also have the kind of aspects of drama and a play because you have characters and voices rather than reported speech mm. and that sort of thing and then you also have the art side of it as well because some of these things are so the marvel stuff is i absolutely love the art and i think because you've got so many different styles between each comic book so you can have sort of two comics featuring the same characters that are done so differently just in the way that they're drawn that they're really just a really nice combination of all of the different art forms that you can want in terms of print i think they're absolutely brilliant i no i quite looking at i quite like looking at that as well because if you look at say an older spider-man and then you look at you know sometimes I, and obviously they've i don't know whether it's still going on but they used to have the newer versions where it was almost like a 3d game mm. but that they'd printed off in a comic book form and that was really weird because you don't think of comic books as being like that but yeah. it was it just looked incredibly slick and you can see but the i didn't real prefer difference. it actually you but. can see the real difference between the old spider-man comics and then when it went digital and then like you said it it's got really 3D slick and, really slick yeah. really uh, they really started putting more things in each frame as well i mean in one frame now there's so much going on that you could spend a good five minutes looking at it yeah. just to try and take in everything that's what i find with a lot because i read a lot of the avengers comics and because there's so many characters and such huge fight scenes that there'll be one double page spread and it'll be so complex so much going on and obviously if you miss one little bit of it one little action that's going on there you're going to be completely thrown off so it is quite a engaging experience because you've got to really try and understand what's going on because there's no movement like so like to where's Wally's where you have to oh find I find someone. it I still find that so hard honestly <laughs> I've got the collection at home Do you remember <laughs> Urban Outfitters were selling the collection of like a bunch of them I find it so difficult still which comedian was it that said um, just because he wanted a break from his children that he actually coloured in the Where's Wally top and then asked his children to look for Where's Wally and they could never find that him that horrible horrible man I Whoever can't remember is, I really can't remember who said that but that's I thought it was to child abuse. genius no that's terrible you don't do that to someone <laughs> it's great. because I spend that much time looking at Where's Wally when I can't <laughs> like when he's not coloured in I love it that is just cruel um it is amazing I was looking up um going back to comic books how much some of them have sold for um like the collector's what are now collector's editions. Some of them who, ha you know, th this was in December 2010, um, which had the first appearance of Superman um, in Action Comics, and it sold for well over a million dollars. Like, yeah. that's just a significant amount of money. And you do think, okay, there's a clear market for it still. Completely, you especially those collector's editions. People aren't interested. Even, the, even ones that aren't that, old or that special still go for a sort of 200 250 quid if you're looking in the right places these collector's editions and do you think because i hate the whole idea you know people that uh it's kind of a american stereotype of the nerd that's got shrink wrapped yeah. comic books don't open yeah. them don't take it out of the original yeah. packaging that sort of thing i hate that stuff i get actually i got mad at my dad the other day because he did bend one of my graphic novels but that's <laughs> just pure disrespect for another person's love i hate it when people bend my books i saw i was on the train it's completely <laughs> unrelated but i was on the train and uh, there was a woman reading the book and she dog-eared the page that she was reading and i was like disgusting it's you do such not a i do know that. i mean it's really weird though because i'm against that but um if i'm reading something and it makes me think of something um i get a pencil and i write nerd are you right in the book yeah that is so, this pencil, I suppose, but... Um, so if anyone ever borrows... And the only books I don't do that is I've got a lot of signed copies from when I was working at the Literary Festival. And with those, I don't. So I've got, like, you know, 40, 50-odd signed books. So those don't get written in. 
But the rest have just got my scrawlings all over them, so which yeah. is really bad because even when I reread them now, I don't find it distracting. It must just be that I'm so used to doing it. That you won't notice yeah. it, yeah. I think it's from being at uni. They used to you make have us to, write in the book. You have to do that, yeah. Um, See, I always think, you know when you open a book, you get from a second-hand bookshop and someone wrote a nice little message in there and they say the year. Yeah, that's quite like, nice. And I'm like, stop doing that. No one cares who you got oh, Janet, yeah. you know, yeah, what you got Janet so for a birthday. No one cares. Stop and doing that. And clearly neither did Janet. Janet didn't you... care because she's in the second-hand <laughs> bookshop. She... Oh, I love looking at those messages. It's always really cute. No one cares. Janet's an idiot. I care. Right, uh, would you like to go on to literary festivals now? Yes, um, so I have nothing we, to say about this one. You do, because you have an opinion on this. Well, no you will opi- in a minute. I have no opinions on so anything. think fast. Um, <laughs> we, there's always been a debate, literary festivals. Um, they've always celebrated authors, poets, um, essay writers, critics of literature. And now um, uh, people are saying that there's too many celebrities who have written books but are not there to discuss books. They're there to discuss themselves and this whole celebrity culture of the person behind it rather than the actual book um so yeah there's been quite a lot of debate surrounding this um who was it that i think it was the international book festival director um in edinburgh nick barley said we need authors not celebrities and he says cheltenham has put on headliners who are not even there to talk about books um celebrities may have interesting things to say and i applaud them for coming but there's something different going on there there is not as much um talk about books and it's more an, a festival of ideas famous people and celebrities so that's not really a festival is what he's trying to say and it's more a collaboration of famous people and their fans um so I, I don't know. I, I don't know how you feel about this. I mean, I was thinking about it a lot, and I'm a sucker for both. I can happily go to the Cheltenham Literature Festival. I think it's fantastic. Obviously, it's my hometown as well. Um, and you do have a good celebrity list. There's no denying that. Um, Who's been there? Um, I, who hasn't, is all <laughs> I can say. I, just, I don't even know where to start. It's, it's all your... Your BBC... Um, Andrew Moore, I'm guessing. Sort of, yeah. He likes that, doesn't he? A um, lot of politicians have been. Um, and then you've got Stephen Fry and David Mitchell and Victoria Corrin and all of those. Have I got news for you guys? Paul Merton's been so many times. Ian Hislop's been pretty much every year. Um, and then you've also got all the authors as well. But there are a lot less than, say... Hayes Festival, who don't agree with that approach at all by the looks of it, and refuse to do that. Um, I do find it uh, quite interesting, actually. I was thinking about this when you you kind of get people in, like you said, you get celebrities in. They might, even if they love books, it makes you think, if just loving books, does that really give you more of a say because you're a celebrity than if someone, say me or you, was just to go there? I mean, that we are, we could essentially do the same job as some of those celebrities because we like books. We could talk about books, but we don't necessarily have any authority on them. But does a celebrity who still doesn't yeah. have any real link to books but just likes them, do they have any authority yeah. on talking about this stuff? I mean, it's the whole thing about what they say is more important. It doesn't matter what it's about. Um, we live in a celebrity era and culture where we're hanging off famous people's every word. Um and it does sometimes feel like that because, yes, they don't actually talk about the books. It is more about them. And but yet I would go and pay to... To see Channing Tatum do readings of yes, Fifty Shades of Grey. Yes, that's just what I would I go would, to I see. I would, completely. Um, actually, I don't, I'm not I'd big... go just to see other people's reactions because it would make me laugh. In the same way that um, J.K. Rowling came to Chapman Literature Festival and Who's, signed my book. I don't know J.K. Rowling, who is she? Uh, yeah, she's written a book about some guy on glasses <laughs> on a train. Um, Alan Ginsberg. <laughs> and he... Yeah, uh, she had, she came and she she said, I'm going to do a book signing afterwards, but, um, you know, that it's going to be quite a while and whatever. It was fine. We waited quite a long time. There was a huge queue. Uh, people had come from so far. It was ridiculous. I mean, I was going, oh, I walked here because the race course is really close to my house. And people were saying, oh, we've, you know, come from Canada. And, and so it was, it was crazy. Um, the best thing was, 
so many people were crying, which I couldn't get over. <laughs> crying in the <laughs> queue whilst waiting to see her. I mean, this one girl literally couldn't breathe, and J.K. Rowling was like, "It's okay," and she was just choking. Imagine that if you died because of that. I know, diet. and uh, JK another Rowling boy in front of me who had ginger hair. When he <laughs> he was that's right, irrelevant. He, no, it's he... relevant to the story. So oh, I was right, saying okay. it. When he stepped up, he was the boy in front of me. When he stepped up to get his book signed, he said to her. I just want to say thank you for all the things that you've done for ginger people in the world. Oh my god. <laughs> what does he what? <laughs> what is brilliant. he Oh wow. And I Some love it. People. So so these moments, I mean She's a ginger activist and she didn't even <laughs> realise. It was great. I loved it. Um I've never been to a literary festival. I'm going to have to come clean. What? I'm going to Edinburgh uh, for the, over my birthday this year. So I'm going to go to Edinburgh for my birthday. That's right. I'm that, that much of a book that the, um, what, Is that the Fringe Festival yeah. you're going to? Yeah, I want to go. Because the, the Fringe and the Book Festival are at the same time, aren't they? They roughly are. Yeah, they overlap by quite a bit. So I'm going to go try and see some comedians. And they haven't announced anyone yet that's going to be there for the show but no. um, you know, there's 350 over 350 literary festivals in this country yes That's because and I'll tell you how I know that because I at one stage where I didn't know what I wanted to do um, so yesterday I <laughs> yeah, was uh, <laughs> um, I actually wrote down a list of quite a lot of them and I remember saying if I took a year out I would try and tick off as many of them as I could um, and then I looked at my bank account and it said no. And it said no, you should um, Your accountant so, called and um, said, that's not happening. Yeah, so I decided to do something That's almost one a day. Else. Yeah, it's crazy. There's just so many, I didn't I didn't even realise. Because um, Bath that, is coming up Bath is coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so I think and then there's the York. The I didn't know York had one. No, for loads of places, um, yeah. But yeah, it, I don't know what I think of it. I do think they're right. It's not a literary festival just because they're talking about books. But you can criticise them for having um, book celebrities as well. I mean, you really could say that having J.K. Rowling there is, as a headliner, is really missing out on all the other people in this country that are doing great things. You could really say that... Yeah, I mean, but I think a good festival should... or has maybe enough scope to do both, where you have the people who are basically celebrities because they are that big. But you also have everyone else. And I think one of the best festivals that do that was Oxford Literary Festival. And I'm not saying that as a plug just because I was there and go every year. But it's they have this balance. They have all the big authors in the Chardonian Theatre and it's packed and you can't move and there's so many people. And then they have others which are in a small room in one of the colleges and there's like 10 people in there. Um, but and sometimes I'd go into one of those and think, Okay, I just I'm just gonna check and see what's going on in here, and then I'll leave in ten minutes. And they're amazing. Um, and so you think, okay, you've stumbled across all sorts. Yeah. So there's, we kind of had that discussion about this university as well, don't we? Because obviously there's quite a few, couple of famous writers here, and it's kind of their achievements overshadow yeah. anything else that people kind of first first name that will come to people's head will be some one of the famous writers and people kind yeah, of overlook anyone true. else's here that could be because i'm sure in terms of the size of this university i'm sure there's got to be some writers here that are doing some great things and some great yeah, kind of thinkers absolutely. generally but then you it does work with celebrities i mean my book choice is based completely on book celebrities and i don't mean like i walk into kind of a shop and I'm like right please show me to Wayne Rooney's autobiography please because I really need to read that <laughs> <laughs> even though I really do I would read it, that. It, no it sounds terrible oh, yeah, it I was in there I was in an Oxfam um, bookshop a couple of months back and someone obviously as a joke had put Stephen Gerrard's autobiography in the literature section <laughs> and I find that absolutely <laughs> hilarious oh, that really took me that one did but yeah I, I base my choice of books on people that I would consider to be book celebrities I'll never just pick up an unknown writer sort of thing out of the blue and it really is a hindrance I think that's a shame because I might be missing out on so many good things mm. but then if it's kind of some guy I've never heard of or I'm looking at I don't know like a Hunter Thompson or something like that someone that I already know that I love uh, I only go for the other yeah, one yeah you do need uh, I think it's good to have people around you who read different things because that's how sometimes you get forced into stuff that's a really interesting point actually about literary festivals as well is i don't know if you've had you did lit so you probably don't have this problem but i find it really difficult to find book people to find people that like books generally and to talk about this thing that i talk about these things i 
don't really know anyone. I unfortunately know you, obviously, and <laughs> somehow we ended up in the same room together talking about yeah, exactly. this on the radio. But well, aren't you so blessed? Oh no, aren't Rare I gift. lucky to have you in my um, life, Tabe? But it's it is that. Yeah, you're right. It's um. So I could go to a literary festival, and I might find my wife. I yeah. might find the first. Trust me, there were a lot of um, people at the literary festival who are suited to people who like books. Yeah, I think I'm going to go and. I just said that in the most polite start. way. What I just wanted to really say was, "There's loads of hot nerdy guys." Yeah, yeah. Uh, guys. Um, Actually, I'm alright with that. Hot uh, nerdy guys is cool with me. But and mostly a lot of people over fifty as well, which is another interesting <laughs> thing because when you look at a hall full of people in Cheltenham who have gone to see a great author um, there were quite a few times and they probably don't like me saying this but there's quite a few times where it was just I'd be sat at the back and it would be all white very middle class um, old people, people with slightly grey hair um, all in front of me um, you couldn't see anything else which is quite funny the white rich middle class male yeah, is our favourite genre of person yeah here at penny dresses um interestingly which is slightly apart from this but um about um donna um i think it's renee who it runs or did run actually um Chatham festival she said that people are intimidated by the word literature and we want it to be ex- uh, accessed by all so they don't like using the word um literature festival and so they kind of try and make it really, oh, it's for everyone, and get celebrities in because they feel that the word literature is intimidating and they do. What do they call it then? A paper festival? I don't know, <laughs> because it is called the Literary Festival. But I didn't like what she said about, I find that really insulting to the public, as if to say, Underestimating. Oh, them. you probably feel literature is a long word. So <laughs> we don't want. Feel like literature is way uh, above you. It just—it's uh, a sweet sentiment, but I just thought, and it's this whole thing about she kind of said it as if to say literature and fun don't come together. You know, you have to you have to make people realise that it's fun. I suppose in terms of, I don't really think of Bouncy Castles when I think of literature. Yeah, but you sh- Well, maybe I am because... I think I, well, I've seen some of the children's events that take place in quite a few of the festivals and they are so... so children and bouncy and crazy and I had to make somebody dress up in a Gruffalo outfit. <laughs> uh, she was not Poor happy. She was girl. a volunteer and I was Poor like, I'm girl. so sorry. But, Actually, I would do that in a shop. Um, I would definitely do that. that and fun. it was great because... She actually said it was really good fun, apart from she had, like, children grabbing onto her leg and not letting go. And she was like, you know, when you can't even see them properly, because if she moved her head down, then the, her thing would yeah, fall off. Yeah, she'd become visible. So she person. just had to hope that there were no kids on her ankles as she, like, waded through <laughs> all these children. So it can be fun. They I mean, should try... I think maybe they should try and... I think that's a good point. They should try and make them more fun. But I suppose the problem is if your main kind of patrons are middle-aged white rich mm. people then you're not going to try and make book it book award fun. winners book award um, winners yeah, yeah but th- you could make it like do you know what? I've never been to one but I'm, I need to go to like a comic convention how much fun do they look because everyone is such a nerd and everyone is such so open. I don't mean that as an insult I absolutely love yeah. the whole nerdy concept of just being that excited by things and the whole cosplay thing how good would it be if it was more encouraged to go to a book festival dressed up as a character dressed up as a writer and yeah. things like that and that's the thing they do that for the kids ones um, I do think that it just switches with the adults' events and all of a sudden it becomes very... Um, Academic discussion. It's just almost, you know... Do they throw the word paradigm them? around a lot? Do they use that probably, a lot? Yeah, probably. I can imagine they use it with paradigm. If they lot. didn't... If it wasn't for the fact that I felt like it was my home and I'd been going for many years, I'd be intimidated. Mm. Um, I, f- I do find... Which, which is I, really I strange, that, isn't it? Not so much the word literature. I don't so much find that intimidating. But I do find the book world quite intimidating sometimes. Mm, we I were do. talking about Charing yeah. Cross the other yeah, day. And Cecil, so <laughs> all of those bookshops on Cecil Court, I kind of walked down there. And that's obviously the more specialist ones. And it says modern firsts on the front of every shop, doesn't it? Yeah. And you're kind of looking. And exactly. I was a little bit like, I can't afford to go in there. I feel like they're quite snobby. Maybe yeah. I'm completely wrong. But there is that kind of... Especially because... I just can't get my head around that if we feel like that and we love books that much, I don't understand who feels they can go in there. Yeah. Um, 
But then what I've always found is that when I go into secondhand bookshops, people kind of take one look at me, especially in the past when I was kind of wearing like tank tops and ripped skinny jeans and had long black hair. And, and stuff in the like last that. week, you've decided and to last, change. In the last your... week, I turned into <laughs> Oscar Wilde. But um, and I would kind of walk in there, and I would maybe it was me feeling more self-conscious about it, but I would feel a little bit like people are looking at you, thinking you don't like books. You didn't look like you mm. like books, and I sort of felt God. like I should be walking in with like a bow tie and a checkered shirt and some glasses on yeah. and going in. You can borrow one of my tweed they jackets. Sh- I feel like book people must look like Bill Nye. Yeah, that they have to look like a certain type. It was like intimidating actually, and even the ones that I did go into had signs everywhere like don't pull the book out by the spine. And oh, I was like, really? oh my I didn't, God. Is that a rule? I didn't know that. Was it? Well, that, that was the one that I went to, which had all the old, like, Rupert. It was mainly children's stuff, actually. So they had loads of collections of Beatrix Potter and um, Rupert Annuals and lots of Alice in Wonderland. Um, and, yeah, you couldn't actually touch anything, which is yeah, really that, It does feel a bit like that sometimes, doesn't it? Um, yeah, it does. Even if it doesn't actually say that. Right, do you want to move on to this quiz then? I don't even have any questions for you. Well, I have two. You have two questions? Yeah. Um, Are you going to be able to think of any off the top of your head? Maybe. Oh, Um, okay, let's try it. Well, let's take it in turns then. If you go, you go first then, because I'm more than happy to embarrass myself with with Can I just say, this this stresses me out, because you know when there's a pub, I've been in a situation several times, where there's a pub quiz, and I always go, oh, there's a book round. And then the quiz master's gone, right, so our next round is on books. And, and everyone, everyone goes, looks to you. Okay, here's the pen and paper. And then I get every know, single yeah. one wrong. Yeah, I do find that. And it's <laughs> just like that, so very stressful. So um, I'm just going to ignore the fact that I'm crap at this part. Right, go on um, and hit me with your question. Okay. Neil Cassidy, do you know who he is? Do I know who Neil Cassidy okay. is? Yeah. He <laughs> was the inspiration, or supposedly, uh, behind which character in On the Road? <sighs> Ooh, uh, Dean Moriarty. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> did you think Did you think that there was a chance <laughs> that... Come on. I just thought you might have forgotten the name of the character. I did for a second then. The I had time. Sal Paradise locked in my head, but I couldn't think Isn't of... Isn't that Dean. a great name? Sal Paradise it is a great name. I like Dean Moriarty as well. Yeah, I do. That's a great name. Um, yeah, you're going to have to wing some questions off the top of your head now than when you run out. Okay, you, uh, you've studied some Burroughs, I believe, haven't you? Um... Yeah, maybe. Have you read some Burroughs? One. I think this is mentioned in On the Road anyway, so you should be fine, this one. But, okay. Uh, William Burroughs built a machine in his back garden uh, to collect uh, this ridiculous, hypothetical, universal life force. Uh, It kind of collects this life force in it, and you kind of sit inside it, and it makes you really happy. And apparently it just improves your life tenfold. But Absolutely ridiculous concept. But what is the name of this pseudoscientific life force? This is in, it's quite, I think... Is um, it the something machine? No, 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 just the life force. It's just got one word. It's called, like, something force. Or something energy, oh, they called no. it. It's and quite, you know what? Do you know, I think it, they, they actually say it more than once. It's in, there's, I think there's quite a big section in On the Road. And I don't know I don't know if you've read Junkie, but it was quite big. No, in, it was quite big it. in Junkie. Uh, apparently Salinger uh, believed in this, I think, as well. And Kerouac uh, was quite interested okay, in it no, as well. Okay, no, I don't know. Tell uh, me. Orgones, they were called. And such a, the okay, thing, no, I would never have got that. The thing was I don't called, even remember that. The thing was a orgone accumulator, is what it was called when it was in his back garden. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, and made me judge Burroughs so terribly. Need to do that. Yeah, should we try that? Just, just make one of those. It's literally just a porta potty in his back garden that he <laughs> sat in, and <laughs> he believed that it gave him. I don't know what he believed it gave him, but he was a bit of a lunatic, wasn't he? Yeah. Right, go on. You got your second question for me. This is a really simple one again. Avengers. Marvel or DC? Oh, are you serious? I know, but Please I forgot don't. that it's you. I Please. was thinking of questions for, I don't know. And then I thought, oh no, it's Alex as I walked don't in. Don't hurt me like that. Um, Please w- get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I actually have to answer. Yeah, One of the guys yeah. on my course, on our course, should I say, uh, asked me a couple of weeks back, I think it was whether Spider-Man was in the same world as Batman. And I was like, Wait, come, I know that, come on. Not... Uh, Marvel Comics. Okay, hold on. Two nil to you. Two nil. Two nil. Um, oh, no, you're going to hate this one. And your man's going to absolutely kill you as well. If oh you no. get if you get it wrong. It's Lord of the Rings question. I'm going to. There's so much. It's not It's not actually a Lord of the Rings question. It's a Silmarillion question. That's even worse. Um, okay, you might get this. 
what is the name of the antagonist in the Silmarillion? Uh, Sauron's master. And he has two names that he goes by. I, I, I do know this. And I will, if you're Googling it, because I can see you on your phone, if you're Googling this, no, I am gonna I'm trying to look this for more show. questions for you, actually. So, either of his names I will completely take. Can I have a clue? I actually sort of remember. Both, I actually do remember. They both begin with M. His, his name it's that like he, gothic. It reminds it, me of gothic. You're close. I'll give you that. You're close. Come on. You're almost oh, there. I can't remember. I actually can't. I, I read this like three days ago. Morgoth. Yes. Is that actually yes, right? that is right. What's right. the other name? Uh, Melkor was the initial name that. that he went by before he... Um, the only reason I read it three days ago is because somebody told me that he wasn't the ultimate um, evil character. And no. I was like, what? Uh, and looked it up and I was thinking, you're... Right, and I'm wrong. Uh, this happens to me far too often. Uh, <laughs> and then that's when I said I need to get that book. I haven't read it yet. So. I think I've got a first edition of it, actually. I just realised this the other day when I was at Cecil Court. They were selling the first, and I realised I think I actually have a first that I bought for £3.50, so I might have that's to quite, you look need into to hang selling on to that. that. Yeah, uh, in the that. same way, I've got a first edition copy of The Hobbit, um, thanks to... Katie Thorne's mum. So, Stacey, if you are listening, I have your book. No name, um, no name drops, man. I know, but I've got a book. But if you don't want it back, even better. Have you got a question for me, then? Um, I am trying to find one. Um, do, you want me to hit, do, you, do you want me to hit you with some more? Do you know what? But if I find a really mean question... Just hit me with a mean question. I'm more than happy to embarrass myself on radio. Right, let me get. Let me give you the next one then. Do you know any um, opening lines to novels? No, no, I no, no. I hate people. No. I oh, hate people who can do. I don't really remember. I can quotes, sort so. of do that with um, with Jane Austen, but I don't want to do it on the radio. No, I'm really um, bad with that. Someone on my course and I basically recited the first paragraph of Pride and Prejudice together, and then realised that we have a sad, sad life. <laughs> um, All right, let me give you a question then. How did Ernest Hemingway die? That's a really good question. It wasn't health related. No. And it wasn't suicide. Is it not? Is it? I don't know. Maybe it was health related. Maybe it was both. Maybe it was a bungee jumping accident. Really? Oh, that does sound like him. No, it wasn't a bungee jumping accident. <laughs> no, I know. Um... <laughs> I want to say no. I don't want to say it was suicide because I was because I always remember the ones who have committed suicide, which is awful. But I do as well. I just do. Um, no, I don't no. know. Uh, shotgun to the face. What? Kurt, Kurt Cobain did a Kurt Cobain. He did. He, it was health related though, uh, kind of potentially because. He's, his father had this uh, disorder that meant that he couldn't process iron in his body, he couldn't metabolise iron, which len- then led to basically mental illness. went absolutely crazy. His father killed himself, his sister killed himself, and his brother killed himself, and then he took his favourite shotgun, put it in his mouth, and painted the garden. That's awful. It's terrible, isn't it? Do you know how Sylvia Plath died? Most people do. Um, I get confused because Plath and Wolf. Uh, both committed suicide, didn't they? I'm yeah. going to go with uh, Head in the Oven. Yeah. Uh, victory. That house is here. Oh, when I say here, I mean in London. Uh, where is it? I want to say Primrose Hill. Can you see the oven? Probably not. <laughs> you uh, think they it? Uh, it's probably in some museum, actually. Right. Um, Would you like one more? Go on, embarrass me further. This go is, for it. This is a tough one. <sighs> Right, this is a nice little note to end on. Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, you know I hated this. I read like half Why? Of it. Why? Just why Fifty Shades of Grey? If someone could please tell me, the, I would be... Is that the answer? That's the question. There's With, just a lot of unsatisfied women out there. Is that... And she thinks that's her audience is the unsatisfied? Yeah. I'm here. Give me a, <laughs> give me a call. <laughs> You don't have to uh, write some terrible yeah, Twilight fanfiction. Or fan you can fiction. just, so if anyone wants to test my theory, then they can tweet Alex at P Dreadful Show and see what response you get. Um, 
Send us some hate mail or something. No one's spoken to us on Twitter yet. We need some. Actually, no, we have. Uh, have, you, uh, have you been working? Have, yeah. have you been working on it? Have you? People discussing books, which is always lovely. Bunch That's all we nerds. want. I, or just say hello, I, or even tell us that we're terrible. Um, that would be. I'll pass that on to Alex. Tell us, yeah, <laughs> tell us we're dreadful. <laughs> if you want us to, you know, get rid of Amita off the show, if you want us to change hosts, please. Right. So this, right okay. So I think this is the end of our show. I this think week. it is. Um, Would you like next week to do the audiobooks? Because we've been talking about doing this for a little while. Yeah. For, because this I is. I think that's a good suggestion. So we'll both listen to an audiobook, whichever it is, and we will give our opinion on that. And we'll do a couple of regular features and that sort of thing. I will write you a poem next time. Yes, you have to write me a poem about what. Well, we'll see what happens over the next week or so. I'll ri- yeah. And see if anything interesting happens is worth writing a book, uh, writing a poem about. I might try one as well. You never know even though I hate poetry, but I might give it a go. Okay, let's see how that goes. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you usual. for listening, guys, if anyone did actually listen. Of course they did. F- um, follow us at P Dreadful Show on uh, Twitter. And we'll be back next Monday. Enjoy the rest of your week.